All right, I'd like to call the first public hearing to order. Uh, this public hearing is for a proposed local law number five, a local law amending chapter 280, zoning of the code of the city of Oswego, New York. Clerk, please call the roll. His Honor the Mayor. Here. Councilor McBrady. Here. Councilor DeMassey. Here. Councilor Hill. Here. Councilor Wilmot. Here. Councilor Gosick. Here. Councilor Tesserio. Here. Councilor Cordino. Here. All present. Thank you. Uh, we have two speakers signed up to speak on the proposed zoning code. I ask that you please step up to the podium, speak into the microphone, state your name and address, and try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. The first speaker is Maureen Wells. Hi, thanks. I'm Maureen Wills. I live at 38 East Cuga Street in Ward 2. And I was going to express my discontent with this, um, but I spoke with Councillor McBrady, and she has helped me understand a little bit more about this. So thank you very much. Second speaker is Bill Meyer. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Meyer. I live at 173 West Albany. Um, I just had a couple of concerns, and I, a, a couple of them may seem trivial, but if you get neighbors that really don't like you, which I've had, it can be a, an issue. The first one is um, <clears throat> the recreational vehicle definition. In there, you said you can have a 40-foot motorhome, which I have a 40-foot motorhome, and you said the height can only be 12 foot high, and I don't know how much you guys know about recreational vehicles, but when you get 36 feet and above, um, they're over 12 feet high. Um, and I know it may seem trivial, but if they're six inches or a foot over and you get a neighbor that doesn't like you, somebody's going to come up and measure it and they're going to tell you to get rid of it. So I thought maybe you guys could tweak that a little bit, and you know, even if you went to 13 feet, that would cover most of the motorhomes and most of the, uh, the uh, fifth wheels, because the fifth wheels as tall as a motorhome when you get above 35, 34 feet. Um, the next um, uh, concern I had was an article, it was 2855-C. It said open parking spaces in public space between the curb and the sidewalk and between the sidewalk and the property line as well as between the curb and the property line in cases where there are no sidewalks shall be prohibited. And my question is, is this a driveway? Do I have to count 33 feet from the center of the road into my driveway to find out where I can park? And if that's the case, when I built my garage, I measured it today, I have 14 feet to park in. I can't park anything there. And in my house, it leaves me with 23 feet. So I don't know if, if this is what you guys had intended for everyone. I mean, if you look at West Fifth Street, that's got a 100-foot right-of-way. So 50 feet from the center of the road, according to well, the way I read this, you can't park your vehicle there. Can you read that again for me, the part yeah. you read? It says, open parking spaces in public space between the curb and the sidewalk, between the sidewalk and the property line, as well as between the curb and the property line in cases where there are no sidewalks shall be prohibited. And the be prohibited was just added. It, did, it used to say you could get a special permit, but why would you need a special permit to park in your driveway if it's behind the sidewalk? Yes, so that's what we did legislatively. The, the council voted in uh, October, November, I want to say. Was it October, November-ish? where we said no more front yard paving, no more paving between the curb and the sidewalk. What we had, an example, landlords would uh, put students in the house and they'd take that grass between the sidewalk and the curb. They'd rip the grass up, put blacktop down, and we want to stop that. Our rationale there was in the year 2019, I mean, what house survived all the way until now without the parking and now all of a sudden needs the parking? Uh, and just neighborhood beautification where we're actually allowing uh, people, mainly landlords, to tear up public infrastructure uh, and then requires the DPW to go do, do a curb cut, remove the curb, and let's 
whoever owns the property destroy the lawn and put in a parking lot so that the tenants can park and block the sidewalk and 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 I understand that I mean that this was put in 527 of 2007 but again that's not what that's not what this says this says from the from the center of the road to the property line are you talking about uh, uh, something that's in the code that we're going to adopt tonight or are you talking about something that's already on the books it it was it was it was put into the code according to what I read today 527 of 2007 okay this part but it, it instead of was instead of saying it was prohibited it said that you could get a permit to park there and I understand what you're saying and I get all that but the problem is where I'm at the the property line starts into my driveway and on West Fifth Street when I lived there the property line started two feet into my mother's living room I said so if, if you guys are going from the property line in I mean, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be not parking because it's... Go ahead, Susan. Go ahead. I, the the intent of uh, this change was to clean up what we had done earlier, well, la late last year, um, and so and it's never been interpreted to mean one's parking lot that's in the public space. But we were not intending to prevent people from using their driveway. Absolutely not. Correct. I think that's I I believe that's in a different um, in a different location than than this uh, provision here. Um. Well, something that happened in 2007, not it, now, it, not it was today. Put it, not it was put into the zoning code according yeah, to in 2007. In 2007. So what we're talking about, what we're doing tonight. But it's part of what was when I when I went through the the new thing. It's uh, it's two eighty dash five five dash C, okay. and it's in it's in the, it's online. And I was going through it. That's where I found. It. Yeah, it, the, the language is. And you added prohibited, which before said you could get a permit. My question is, why would you want to permit to park your own And the way it's worded, I understand what you guys were trying to do. And I, you know, from the sidewalk to the curb. I get, but that's not what that's not what this says. This says from the from the center line of the road to the, where the property line starts. And if you if you measure out, it's going to be into the it's going to be into everybody's driveway, and it's under off street parking. So I'm assuming it's my driveway. It's never been interpreted that way. Since 2007, but that's and what it says. Perhaps I'm just, beyond, I, and, you and you're entitled to your I mean, your your interpretation. I'm just telling you historically, at least for the last 12 years, probably before that, and and going into the future, it's never been interpreted the way you're interpreting it. We're we're not prohibiting someone from using their own driveway. Okay, I Simply just want to make sure if somebody well, complains. But is, is this you know, proposed a problem for you since 07? No, no. Well, then what do we? Well, then okay. Well, because the I'm, re I'm, I'm reading it. it okay. Could it could be a problem for somebody. What's next? You no. Know? Um, <laughs> all right. Whatever. The other one is 280-71-A, uh, and I've brought up this point before. I, it was last spring when I mentioned it, where it says van, buses, and trucks of more than three-quarter tons carrying capacity, motor vehicles used for drag racing, stock cars, and yeah, no, I get that not being able to park in your driveway. But if a guy's got a one-ton truck, I just don't understand why they can't put that in a driveway. If somebody complained about it, they would <coughs> technically, according to your zoning ordinance, would have to move it. And while you're changing them, I thought you could make that change. You know, a lot of people have a one-ton truck. We're getting back to the RV thing to haul a, a large uh, fifth wheel. 
And again, if you get a neighbor that doesn't like you and you got a one-ton truck in the yard, according to your zoning, he's either got to put it in a garage, and if he doesn't have a garage, he's got to move it. And I just think that's kind of a silly law. I get the buses and I get the vans, but I don't understand a pickup truck. Give me some examples of a one-ton truck. A one-ton truck is an F-350, a 3500. I mean, everybody has them for hauling big... A friend of mine's got one for hauling his fifth wheel. Again, you know, it's just I'm just trying to be proactive instead of reactive. If you get a guy down here because his neighbor gets mad at him and the zoning comes up and tells him he's got to move his truck because it's in the zoning law that he can't have anything bigger than a three-quarter ton truck in his yard. And that's been on the books forever, but I mentioned... So a one-ton truck's like a dually? They no, pull a, a one-ton truck doesn't one have to be a dually. You can get a single, single wheel one-ton truck. A Ford F-350 or a, a Chevy 3500? All, right. All right, well, we can look at that, but again, that's, yeah. that's what the code is written now. I'm talking about, you know, do you have any changes of what you want? You're looking at the code if that, it that passes, we'll put in tonight. It, it, but, it, right, but you're, t you're bringing up issues that are in the old code and will still be in the new code, and you're using the new code to say, let's go back to the old code and fix everything, which we can certainly look at the issues. But that's what you were no, doing no, when to you what, no, what, the code. Wrong. What tonight is... No. Okay. is if there's any major differences between the old code and where we're going in the new code that you're uncomfortable with, you can bring them up to discuss why you're uncomfortable with them. What we're not going to do is go back through the old code from 1980 and talk and dissect it and edit it then because we're opening up and putting in a new code. Oh. If there's a change we're making, that's what we want to hear. That's the purpose of tonight. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that's it then. I don't... Uh, I guess that's all I have. Thanks. Anything else? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else like to... Yep. Sure. I found a question in this. Um, the table of uses in the traditional business, it says a one-family dwelling needs a special permit. Does that mean I now have to have a special permit to live in my home? Ask me that again. Pardon me? Can you ask me that question again? According to your City of Oswego table of uses, in the traditional business district, which you are now putting me in a traditional business district, it says dwelling, one family, needs a special permit. Do I now need a special permit to live in my home? No, it's for a new build. If you're going to build a house on a vacant lot, you've got to go to the planning board and get permission. What if I wanted to raise my house and put a new one up? What if you want to raise the house and put a new one up? If, if it's on the same lot, it's a lot of record, it was a building of record, you'd be fine. Okay, thank you. Great. Would anyone else like to uh, speak on the zoning code? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Hill, Councillor Corradino, will clerk please call the roll? Councillor McBrady? Yes. Councillor DeMassey? Yes. Councillor Hill? Yes. Councillor Wilmot? Yes. Councillor Gosick? Yes. Councillor Tesserio? Yes. Councillor Corradino? Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. The public hearing is adjourned. Uh, and I'll open up uh, public session. Public session, the same rules apply. Step up to the microphone, state your name and address, and try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. I have two speakers signed up. The first speaker is Larry Klotzko. Hello. How do you do? I don't recognize some of you. I haven't seen you out drinking. <laughs> Shame. So I wanted to say that I've been on Water Street for 40 years. I broke into the north end of the market house window, it was unlocked, and looked around the building and loved it. And Mike Farrell, the beat cop, asked what I was doing. I said, I love it and I want to rent the place. Who owns it? So he sent me over to Dick Mitchell's office and I bugged the hell out of him and finally got him to agree to let me have it and trade for fixing it. And I've been there ever since. And when I first was on Water Street, Things were really nice. We were working on the building every day. And then in 1978, there seemed to be some political interest in the property around Water Street. The 
railroad that used to run through there ceased to operate. The tracks and the land that is the parking lot next to the market house, Old City Hall, became owned by the city because the railroad had a provision clause. The apparent heirs were so dead and gone that to find them would be like finding the original owners of the property where the railroad building is that Joe Castaldo has saved by putting a roof on it. Anyway, Carl Irwin did the roof. So the parking lot that was built next to the old city hall was built with money that was assessed to the adjoining properties. That parking lot was built with money from the adjoining properties and we have rights to that parking lot, which we only exercised once when there was a threat to not allow us to use it before it went to Supreme Court. The city agreed to allow it to stay without the problems and I don't need to bring them up right now. So when the pocket, when we were invited to the McCroby building to talk about the $10 million split with everybody doing this and that here and there and I went there my suggestion was a railroad from Syracuse everyone talked about later that there was a pocket park going to be built between the coffee connection and the Ferris wheel and what was Jerem travel between First Street and Water Street and Water Street and First Street where Market Street is so and I understood this was going to happen I thought it was a shame to lose seven parking spots I thought that the land should have gone to the two property owners adjacent to it. And back in the 70s, that concrete thing that's on First Street stopped the circulation of that block. Water Street was a two-way street and Market Street was open to traffic. And then they closed it, they built St. Luke's, they blocked off Water Street. And when St. Luke's got built soon after that, there was a meeting not unlike this where the council was going to vote to take Barrett Insurance, Stoney's Auto Parts, what was the Nuss, Balmer and Clark offices, what's the dirt lot, what was Reichel's, what was the left bank, Market Street is next, then came the Ferris wheel, then came Greco's Appliances, then came Lupian Sport Shop and Goldberg's. All those buildings were going to be taken one night by eminent domain. I convinced Dick Mitchell, Al Levine, Old Man Barrett to come down here to raise hell so their properties would stay there and Water Street could stay antique and pretty. So now I, I see that it's not just a pocket park getting built, but they're narrowing Water Street to 13 feet. How many of you drove here tonight? Do you mind me asking by a show of hands? Can I ask who drove here tonight? So the parking lot at Water Street has 43 parking spots. The Market Street parking area has seven. There's four de facto spots on Water Street between the Ferris wheel and um, the former Buckout Jones building or whatever they call it. So right now there's a 53, 54 spots. When this plan that isn't just a pocket park on Market Street gets done, there is going to be a loss of 19 parking spots, which is over a third of the parking. There, we're starved for parking, by the way, and we're a winter town. People don't want to walk two blocks to go eat dinner in the wintertime. Also, there's a Frankenstein-style um, walkway for handicap down to the river from Water Street that's going to make it so if I have a delivery, I get 100,000 pounds of goods a year at least. If I get a delivery, I'm expected to take the railings down, back my trucks in, pull into the backyard, put the railings back up, and then when I want to leave, put the, take the railings down, pull the vehicles out and put them back up. This is what I'm told is, is an unreasonable way to have someone have an expectation of doing business. And even though it's all in stone and signed, sealed and delivered, I was never invited to any meetings to discuss taking the parking lot. I was never invited to any meetings talking about turning Water Street into a 13-foot alley with nowhere for a tractor trailer to pull over. We have 23 tractor trailers that deliver a week average to the businesses that are there now. The coffee connection left because he couldn't stand the idea of losing all the parking, not because the bricks were falling from Warren Shaw's building. So right now, the way this plan is, if I want to have my maintenance guys pull in the backyard spontaneously, let's say the exhaust hood has a fan belt gone and it's winter time and there's snow piled up, they got to go find where these railings detach, take them off, pull in, put them back, et cetera, ad nauseum. If you people will have cars, would drive down Northwest or Southwest 9th Street tonight 
and see what a nightmare that street could be. If it, imagine it having commercial traffic. Imagine tractor trailers, garbage trucks. There's four different garbage companies that take garbage from the Water Street area. There's constant taxi cabs. We get people with walkers, canes, crutches. They get dropped off. They're very slow. So the car pulls up to wait for them. If someone goes to lunch and they happen to have a handicap and they get out of that car, they're going to move like a snail to go back to their car to and from and traffic can back up to Bridge Street if they're waiting to get in there. Sometimes you have Dorsey's trucks come at the same time as different food purveyors as well as a garbage truck. You have deliveries that are coming and going. It's, a, it's just an unreasonable thing, A, to take our parking lot with giving us consideration, B, to, to put a, a, a railing in front of our property so we can't access it. I understand this is just a public session and I don't get to get a response, but I think it's unreasonable that this happened and I did call a takings attorney and they did tell me that there might be some teeth even though this was signed into stone and I have to go see her. It cost a lot to file a federal motion. I was hoping that you people could give some consideration to the Water Street area, which I love, and I'd like to see those old buildings get fixed someday and I'll be gone, but maybe they'll stay here. We could have some quaint old downtown that was extant instead of all the urban renewal that builds things that look like St. Louis Luke's with prefabricated slabs that they pile up like a little Lego set. There's, there's nice old buildings. The, the Ferris wheel is a beautiful building. The, the Goldberg's building is beautiful. I think someday Warren Shaw's building might get fixed up. I'm not sure what his plans are. And I love the Market House, and it's a historical building, by the way. It was originally built as the town Market House. It was the first jail, the first post office, the first sheriff's office. The f soldiers from the garrison practiced marching in the winter on the third floor in the ballroom. And it became a city hall in 1848 when the city didn't have this. And after the Unification War, you were given this stipend to build this great building, and that building became this and that for other things. So we weren't considered, uh, regardless of people's opinions on who the persons occupying the properties are, it's a beautiful old street. Having a 19-foot sidewalk and a 13-foot street makes no sense. So if the city wants to to do something, I think there could be a compromise. I've called three architects and a few engineers since before I got here, and they said you could do things like pave the street, put provision for balusters in so traffic couldn't come down. If you wanted to make it a walkway for a day because you had an event, go ahead and do it. But as far as turning it into a, a place with extra trip hazards, a place that has no provision for delivery, a place that's going to take a parking lot from properties that were assessed for that lot, that's like people going to your house and taking your yard and saying, we're building this without even giving you notification. I'm not psychic. I read 14 newspapers a day average, most of them European, and I would appreciate having some consideration to redo some of this with engineers that have some brains so that we can function at our place. I love all the stuff the city does. I appreciate Tom Kells plowing the snow. I appreciate the police dealing with bad actors. I appreciate the water department giving us water that's not going to poison us. I, I love Oswego. I love the market house. And I want some help from you people as opposed to being crushed, destroyed. And I think this is a bad plan. I know this is getting to be time. But in 1979, as a result of the Fresh Water Act of 1972, the addendum in 1977, mandated that we build a sewage separation project. I foiled the plans. They were designed by Nussbaumer and Clark. I paid a physicist $100. He told me that when this is done, there's going to be sewage this high, blowing out a linear park. It's going to flood my yard with raw sewage, and it's going to flood the river with a point discharge of sewage that's illegal. Dick Mitchell sent a letter here on my behalf to the mayor at the time to put the city on notice that we didn't want to be flooded with sewage. And the project got built as planned. And then later, you people, I think, got an $83 million upgrade that you got to do because initially no one paid attention to the engineering. I'm telling you this engineering plan is not good in terms of the surface and what they're doing to the parking lot and traffic flow. If, if there is a way that we can perhaps discuss 
an alteration to this to provide for delivery, traffic flow. If you came with an old lady and you wanted to park in front of the place to let her out, you shouldn't have to back traffic up down the block. If you get deliveries and garbage removal, you shouldn't have to stop traffic. Traffic flow is a necessary thing in life. Look at New York City. Look what they're doing now. They're putting wireless things in to tax all the cars to drive downtown because they can't handle the traffic. That's it. That's the gist of it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next is uh, Jerry from the softball. Give us some good news, Jerry. That's what I'm here for. That's why J Justin and I are here. All positive stuff. Hey, spring is about here. You know, we might see a little bit more snow, but it's not going to stop us from opening the gates next week up at Legends Fields and getting ready for sports. So with that being said, we're here tonight to talk about what happened in 2018 and what our plans are for 2019. And... Uh, give you our wish list and, uh, and take it from there. So if you look at this uh, PowerPoint we put together, um, we put it together pretty quickly today. There is a typo on the last page, so don't fall out of your seats when you see the, the last page yet. Um, but let's, I, we just want to take just a few minutes to go over these pages. We'll make it within five minutes and then open it up for any questions that you may have. Um, 2018, as you know, we, we went in. We walked the property before there was any electricity. Um, we all know that the fields were overgrown. The, the facility needed a lot of TLC. And with the help of the city and the DPW and you know, the administration, uh, everybody pitched in and we had a grand opening and got everything done, at least reclaimed the surfaces of the infields. Um, some of the things that we accomplished, we, you know, we put the website up, uh, we, you know, Facebook pages, all the social media content, all that stuff's out there. We, uh, we refurbished the building uh, with the you know, the equipment, painting the inside, uh, reclaimed the restrooms and all that stuff. Uh, we landscaped the grounds around the main building um, from seven teams in 2017 up to 28 teams last year, uh, you know, from as far away as a couple different counties. Uh, we brought in three slow pitch adult tournaments, and we also relocated the youth softball organization up to Legends, and the parents and the league officials loved it. We also had six tournaments up there. We pulled tournaments from around the state, as some of you may know. And you, if you get a chance, go to our website, championsevents.org. Click on it, look at it. You'll notice that we'll, we run uh, or, uh, tournaments all the way from Buffalo down to Long Island. So we cover the state. We actually run 103 age group tournaments a summer. I should say throughout the, the year, 10 months out of the year. In fact, we're just finishing up over in Pinnacle Athletic Campus in Victor, New York, near Rochester. There's a facility there we run during the winter. They have two 236 fields indoors, completely heated. So we're getting ready next week to, to hit Legends with our crew to get, get the facility ready. And, uh, and with that, as we turn the page to, uh, to the 2019 plan, I just want to let you know that with the city's help last year and the adult, the adult league uh, income that came in, we were about $42,600. And we ended up spending just for the leagues to get the facility going and some of the maintenance we did, we were about 51000 So, in essence, you know, Champions Events did chip in some money. And we, there's a lot of money that's unaccounted for we didn't put in here, some of the small things. So. But the good news is 2019. Uh, we found out through, uh, I think it was you, Rob, that, uh, that the facility turns 25 years old. It's in the middle of its 25th anniversary. So we're planning with some of the constituents uh, a celebration with a fast pitch tournament, adult fast pitch tournament on Saturday, June 8th. Um, we've already talked to some of the publications and uh, we're going to put that all out to the public uh, probably around the first week of May or so. The adult leagues, we're going to run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're expecting 30 plus teams. We're ahead of schedule from last year right now. Probably the most important thing is we're holding the uh, registration fee to 295, which is unheard of uh, in other markets, Syracuse and uh, other markets, they're at 595. So it's a heck of a deal for all the teams out there. Um, every penny that we bring in 
through league registration goes right back into the facility, every penny. So if you do the math on that, you'll know right out of the gate what's going back into the facility this year. Um, we plan on running three slow pitch and three state championship events, which I think we you probably saw that on Twitter, some of you. Um, so just Legends and Oswego is going to get a lot of press out of that from around the state and nationally. Um, youth Travel Team League, we're establishing that this year with the help of Heidi Hazen out of Central Square. She runs a facility there. She's, you know, her and her sister are in the Hall of Fame, so they're going to be helping us bring that in. And then we plan on, ha on relocating 14 events, youth events, and they're all on our website. If you take a look at it, you'll see which ones. We're even bringing in a couple of um, national events. We're bringing in uh, Champions Nationals with, through uh, a USA Softball and also uh, jun the Junior League games through Top 100 Sports. So you're going to see a lot of cars driving around Oswego this summer, a lot more than last year. The next page talks about the improvements that are needed, and we know this is the wish list part of, this, of the uh, presentation. Um, we didn't quite finish field five and six. We're going to be taking that on ourselves, and uh, we'll talk about that money in just a few minutes. Uh, the big things, the three big things that didn't get done last year that were somewhat promised to us, and we've talked to, uh, you know, a few people in the administration, is uh, replacing the field lights. Because the lights weren't on last year when we went in, we could not diagnose how bad it was. The good news is, compared to what was spent before, which is roughly $60 a bulb, we found a source right now about $30 a bulb. So that's going to save us and the city some money. The big thing is we don't mind paying for the bulbs. We just need a lift truck, you know, to put them in. And uh, that kind of spells that out on the next page. Uh, a couple other items, just reinstall the scoreboard that was blown down on field two. Um, and, uh, and then replace the field equipment. Uh, the piece of equipment that's up there is about 25 years old. So I don't think anybody in the room has a 25-year-old lawnmower. Um, we certainly need help with that as we had discussed last year that was in the agreement. Th these other items, we're going to be taking care of some of this, as you can see. Like, the most important thing we think after those three items is the fence repair. It's a safety issue. We've got on the backstops, there's poles that are falling down. Um, there's holes in the fences. I mean, think about it. 25 years, uh, the fences are all bowed out. They really need to be replaced. We did get one estimate from, uh, from Butler, who did the original work there, and they were a little over $30,000. It may sound like a lot of money, and we're not asking for that right now. All we're saying is, is that that's going to be close to the cost of what it's going to take to repair those fences. And to draw big events, you have to have a quality facility, and that's what we're working towards. We did recently talk to the county um, and a few people in here about reclaiming the walkways. I mean, it, it really needs to be done. Things do settle after 25 years. Um, we're going to be replacing the screens in the building. Um, we're, we want to install a security booth, which we just purchased. It's up at the facility. We plan on charging the vehicles that come in for our tournaments on the weekends and using those funds for the parking attendants and to go for improvements back into the facility. We believe the faster we get the facility up to where it needs to be, um, the, the, the more tournaments we can bring on the, in on the weekends, which will create more revenue for the area. The landscaping, we're going to be doing some things out there. As you may know right now, the National Grid is up next to the property. They're, they're clear-cutting uh, 75 feet wide paths that are going through. They were nice enough to install a fence up there, so they're not going to bother us. They took away some of the parking, but it's not as bad as we thought. The big thing is maybe getting a, a light. They're going to be working late. They've got, they're going to have lights up there as well. Um, there really needs to be a, a street light uh, in front of the property. There's, there's not one up there now. And when you have 100 cars, 150 cars going out of there at night, you really need a street light. I don't know if many of you go up there that often, but the traffic really moves through there. And it's a safety issue. Um, and then the last thing is the sports field upgrades. We're going to take that on this year. We're going to screen all the outfields. We're going to polycap everything for safety. Um, it's really going to take on a different look once we make those changes this year. So we're excited about that. You know, Justin and I, we feel, you know, this is more of an, than an agreement. This is, it's a partnership. We really believe that. We really believe that, you know, that Legends is a hidden gem. I know we've said that to you, Mayor, a few times. It's the only facility in upstate New York that has six lighted fields. And the youth market's growing. And this facility is poised, if the work is done, to really 
become an economic impact for the, for the, for the city and for the county, quite frankly. So the next page is the 2019 cost estimates. Now, again, this is a wish list. Don't get scared by it. The big number here is really the fencing, and we know that's going to take some time. What we really need to help with is, is the labor from the city. That's really the key. As you can see down below, you'll see what the costs are to Champions events. We know we have to make these changes to bring these tournaments in. If we don't make these changes and we have these teams come in, which we're thinking about, fi about 504 teams right now that are registered to come in, they won't come back. So we're, we're in a corner. We know we've got to make the changes, and we know once we make the changes, we can grow it. So if there's any questions on the, on the numbers, I'll take that in just a minute. The last page, which I don't want you to fall out of your seats, the number is incorrect. The actual number, economic impact, is 1.84 million. There's a typo in the gasoline number. We did this today about 4.30. So we believe with 14 events, and you can verify this at our website, all the teams that are registered and paid, 7,000 players, 2,000 coaches, and about 21,000 family members. 30,000 people of those tournaments are going to come through here. And I know, you know, the hotels, we're contracted right now with the hotels for 2,963 rooms in Oswego, four hotels. So that's $453,000 in economic numbers that are coming in. If you look at the restaurant number, $20 a person, two meals a day, 30,000 meals, it's $1.2 million in restaurant money. So, and I'm sure some of you remember when we brought nationals up here last year, I heard from everybody in town that the, the town was packed. They couldn't figure out what was going on. They didn't know what was going to hit them because there wasn't a lot of publicity in time to get it up here um, and advertise it, which that's being done now through some of the publications. And then entertainment. If 1,600 people, only 1,600 people go out and spend 25 bucks a piece, that's 40,000. So that's where that eco economic impact number comes from, 1.884. 040 is the number, and that comes from a gentleman named Mike Morocco. He was the former town manager at the town of DeWitt. He was involved in the Carrier Park project, which that's still ongoing right now. That's a $12 million project. They just completed phase one a few years ago. They're having their issues. But he's the one that wrote that plan, and this is where we got the numbers. So with that being said, we'll take any questions you may have. I, I'd like to just close with saying we know we came up here and we, got, we asked for a second round last year so we could finish because, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of work to be done. And we came in here and said, you know, we don't think we'll need more. But again, we view this as a partnership. And if we want to grow it together and bring these youth tournaments in here to help the local economy, it'd be wise. So with that being said, I'll take any questions you may have or Justin will. Great. Well, first I'll say uh, thank you for coming and providing the report. And more importantly, thank you for what you did last year. Not only, uh, it's no secret, we were really uh, at a dead end as far as the future of softball goes. I think it was probably 60-40 softball wasn't going to continue uh, until, thanks to Councillor Cordino's uh, leadership, to having a public meeting, you guys stepped up and expressed some interest, and we worked out an agreement. And, uh, you know, certainly without you guys stepping up, I don't think softball would have happened not only would have not happened, but certainly would have, would not have had the uh, participation, turnout, and impact on the community that it had last year. I know I went up uh, to throw the first pitch, if that's what you want to call what I did. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't a strike, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, but I was amazed at how much work you did, and with some help uh, from our DPW, but how much work you did on your own. And then, of course, just the... Uh, the cars in the parking lot, the teams, the participation, the numbers, uh, not only of us, a lot of Oswego City residents uh, told me they were thrilled with the league continuing and improving, but also from out of town around Oswego County and beyond. And also the, the spillover effects, the restaurants, the hotels. I mean, it was so obvious. You're exactly right when you say people were confused as to why the city was so busy. Because it was, and they didn't realize uh, what we were doing up at uh, Legends Field. So I, I know that you uh, exceeded my expectations and just did a, a great job, and I appreciate all the effort and work uh, you put into it. And that being said, I think you're 100% uh, right when you say it's a partnership, not necessarily an agreement. Uh, and you know where I stand, and the council knows where I stand, but you summed it up 
better than probably I could by using those terms. And, uh, you know, I know I'll let the, the council weigh in if they wish or just give an opinion or maybe if you guys have a follow-up meeting. But, you know, I certainly think that uh, after seeing the uh, outcome last year, it'd be wise of the city to support uh, champions further uh, in their administration of Legends Field and to, uh, to do what we can to make sure that you can focus on growing the league uh, and continuing the league for years to come. And I'm happy to keep, uh, my personal position is happy, I'm, I'm happy to keep uh, helping uh, you continue with, with either field maintenance or equipment or uh, whatever the city can do. Having said that, I'll say my personal position is I would much prefer to entertain the list of purchases or a direct financial assistance that the city can offer as opposed to having uh, our DPW go spend uh, man hours up there and I'll explain why. Uh, this summer, uh, this spring, it's already uh, started. We have uh, at least five projects that I can think off the top of my head that I'll say are uh, serious improvement projects where you have to finish the Harbor Trail project that we started last year. We have the Seneca Street Bikeway project, the Handicap Park installation. We just won a, over a million dollar grant for marina improvements we're going to tackle this summer. And we're also building a river dock down by Veteran Stage. We're doing all of that in-house. On top of all those projects, we have two projects with Brittany Hills and Munn Street. We, that could go either way, on, on, uh, depending on how quick the counselors get those projects going. In addition, we have uh, our regular duties, too, brush pickup, street cleaning, cleaning up downtown. Uh, I know this time of year, which is probably when you're getting ready to go, we're doing our road prep for our paving projects. So my point is, we only have a 60-something person DPW, and um, they only go so far. And when we even stretch that more thin by doing these projects in-house to save money, uh, it's hard. And I just feel I'm uncomfortable saying to you, you know, yeah, I'll send the DPW up there for a week to help you out when I know I probably am not going to deliver that or something will change where I can't. So anyway, that's my position. There's seven other people here that have some say in the matter, but uh, I'm happy to continue financially supporting uh, champions. I'm happy to uh, continue to make purchases up there, equipment, infrastructure, fencing, whatever that may take. I'm a little reluctant to promise man hours. Of course, we can get up there for easy stuff, you know, stuff if, if we can get up there and get out quickly and do things like that. I know we're going to get to the scoreboard if we haven't uh, already. So uh, things like that I think we can accomplish, but um, I'm just reluctant to promise sure. anything bigger than that because I don't want to be not true to my word. So anyway, I'll, I'll uh, again say thank you. I think you ex exceeded all of our expectations and I look forward to uh, doing what I can to, to help you and uh, look forward to working with you for years to come and I'll leave the first pitches from now on to Cordino. <laughs> Ron. Well, thank you, Mayor. You answered some of the questions I would have had for the, the, the city and the contribution that we would make to help. The only thing I'm asking for is I, I think uh, Council President Cordino ought to be on a team. So <laughs> let's let's get him back in the business <laughs> of playing <laughs> softball. And I, I'm I'm saying that because this is spearheaded by this gentleman right here. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be here today mm -hmm. if Councilor Cordino didn't sell this to us. We really wouldn't. And uh, you know it, it, it's turned into what I think is a plus plus. Yeah, so, uh, you. you know, we, we, we can gain. We, 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 we see the numbers. I think we'd be crazy not to embrace it. And I, I it's good to have softball back in the swiggle in a big way. Sure. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Rob. Thank you. You probably know where I stand on this, <laughs> no surprise. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, over 25 years ago, our predecessors, the, the mayor and the council at the time, saw fit to uh, uh, put this complex in. I believe it was over a million dollars. In today's uh, uh, dollars, that's probably over a couple million dollars uh, investment that they put in um, back 25, 26 years ago. And the seeds that they planted back then we're reaping the benefits of, uh, as uh, Jerry has indicated and the mayor eloquently spoke about, that uh, uh, 
we have a gem, no, no doubt. Huh. Any other community our size would give their left eye tooth for a, a, a facility like this, as you said. Six lighted fields yes. uh, in one area, uh, Fulton, Watertown, Cortland, any other community our size uh, would love to have a facility like this. And, mm -hmm. and again, the investment was made many, many years ago, and I think we wouldn't be doing a service if we didn't try to support that. So uh, that's pretty much all I have to say, and thank you again for coming and sure. uh, sharing that, those thank details. You. Thank, you. thank you. Great. Anybody else? Uh, I guess I'd recommend Councilor Cordino, how do you, you know, if they have equipment or something they want to see, how do you, uh, the council has to approve it, obviously. Should we, should we set up a follow-up meeting or should we? Uh, yeah, a follow-up uh, meeting I think would be a good idea to, to kind of uh, put that list uh, together in a final format and maybe put some numbers together. Yep. As you said, the DPW is uh, too busy. And maybe we can uh, put some numbers together and see what we can do to address those needs for 2019. Great. Okay. Okay. Great. We'll get with you Thank here you. shortly. Thank you. All right. Any miles? I'll make it for you. All right. I know you want to see from, a, from, from a retired softball player who has played everywhere. Hopkins Road. You ever play there? Yeah. I hear it's a mess now. It's not too good. I would like you to just continue on with this guy. He looks like he's going to do a bang-up job, and I've heard good stuff up there from other people. I don't go up there. I'm retired now, Robbie. It's for you. Thank you. Great. All right, anyone else like to speak during public session? Seeing none, I'll close public session, and we'll call the meeting to order. Will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Please call the roll. His Honor the Mayor. Here. Councilor McBrady. Here. Councilor DeMassey. Here. Councilor Hill. Here. Councilor Wilmot. Here. Councilor Gosick. Here. Councilor Tesserio. Here. Councilor Cordino. Here. All present. Thank you. Anything under the Mayor's report from the Councilors? Seeing none, will Clerk please call Resolution 125. Approved minutes Common Council meeting held March 25th, 2019. Councilor McBrady, Councilor Tesserario. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Will clerk, please call resolution 126. Appoint Commissioner of Deeds. Councilor Cordino, Councilor Hill. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Will clerk, please call Resolution 127. Approve use of city properties of Swigo Harbor Festivals Incorporated for Harbor Fest 2019 to be held July 25th through 28th, 2019. Councilor Gosick, Councilor McBrady. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserario. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 128. Approved use of public space, Charles Berger, owner of commercial property located at 81 East Bridge Street in order to install a new hard surface and cafe seating. Councilor DeMassey. Councilor Gosick. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. The clerk, please call resolution 130. Approve use of public space sidewalk talk community listening project in order to host community listening events during the calendar year 2019. Councilor McBrady, Councilor Wilmot, any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 131. Accept donation of a Matrice 200 drone and a FLIR thermal imaging camera from Camden Group for use by the fire and police departments. Councilor Cordino, Councilor Hill, any comments? Will clerk, please call the roll. 
Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Well, clerk, please call resolution 131. Approve local law number 5 of the year 2019, a local law amending chapter 280, zoning of the code of the city of Oswego, New York. Councilor Hill, Councilor Gosick. Uh, I won't be as in depth as I was. Uh, at the committee meeting because uh, I think uh, we've been as transparent as possible uh, during this entire process. Just to give some historical context, the last time the zoning code was rewritten was 1980, so we've been operating under the same zoning code since 1980. Uh, back almost 18 months ago now, we uh, hired an outside law firm, a lattice law firm, to uh, totally rewrite our zoning code. At the same time, I appointed uh, several people to the uh, rewrite committee to help the chair of the planning, bo planning board, the zoning board, uh, some stakeholders, including Paul Stewart from the ORA, some councillors, both from the previous council and the current council, uh, and um, some local developers were involved as well. Uh, Kevin Caracoli and Justin Rudgick were both a, a great help uh, here at City Hall. Uh, Jeff McGann was a great help as far as the building and permitting uh, aspect of this document goes. So it's taken a lot of work and a lot of time uh, and it's really consumed a lot of city resources here but I think it's worth it. Uh, the final document's worth it. I think it's a document we can all be proud of and it's a document that really should uh, propel this city for at least 40 years. Who knows, maybe 40 years from now they'll look back and say it was trash too but uh, the same way we're looking at ours uh, uh, now, but I think right now it's the type of document we need. Uh, I recently said that uh, we've made a lot of progress and a lot of changes without the support of a competent zoning code. Uh, so now imagine what we can do now that we're reinforced and have the backing of a zoning code that actually speaks to the goals and aspirations we have as a city. Right now I'd argue our zoning code's working against us in many respects. So uh, it's very exciting if you're uh, interested in getting more details. The Pal Times I thought gave a great uh, rundown today uh, in their coverage of the districts and what we uh, hope to accomplish and why we're doing this. But uh, January 22nd planning committee meeting, uh, which is on YouTube, uh, I gave about a 35 minute uh, detailed summary on all the changes that, uh, that we were hoping to accomplish in this uh, rewrite. Uh, I know it was posted on the city website the next day, so since January 23rd, the proposed code has been on the city website, the table of uses, the map uh, has been on the city website. Uh, I know I've done social media posts, Councillor McBrady has done social media posts. It's gone through the planning board twice, I believe, through the zoning board twice, I believe. So. I'd argue it's been extremely transparent. Uh, there's been a lot of time for public input. Here we are in uh, April, which is a lot longer than I would have uh, liked, but uh, we wanted to make sure we heard everybody's concerns uh, and that we did it right. So um, I'll say that a few changes that we made since the uh, January 22nd planning meeting, very uh, subtle changes. I don't think anything that should surprise anybody. Uh, we made three small uh, line boundary changes, uh, one of them being actually four. Uh, one was on East 2nd Street, East 2nd Street uh, where we moved the TB line. Uh, Councillor McBrady was adamant that we extend uh, the line down uh, 104 on the east side some more, which after uh, considering that's the right move, so we made that change. Uh, we made a change on West 2nd Street to accommodate uh, quality carpets in their building, which made sense. And then uh, Shore Road, which is out by the dog park, we simply overlooked that uh, the first time we had it zoned industrial. If you go out Mitchell Street and take a left, there's actually uh, a neighborhood back on the lake, and when we were going through the rewrite, we just overlooked that. So a resident called uh, and said, hey, you know, I'm a little nervous. My residential neighborhood is being zoned industrial, and we just uh, uh, overlooked that, so we corrected that. And that's really it for the boundary line changes. Uh, no real uh, language changes since the 22nd. Uh, the one major change, I'll remind everybody that our new zoning code, one of the more exciting things in my view is we're taking the smoke shops, vape shops, tattoo parlors, uh, head shops, 
uh, and we're actually being a little proactive in looking at marijuana dispensaries. Uh, we're moving them uh, out of the core downtown where they are now. One thing that irritates me is sitting at the West 2nd Street uh, in 104 intersection and you look to your right and you see bongs and everything else in the window. I just don't think that's really what we want at that corner of all corners. So we're moving them out to what is now uh, zoned industrial out by the dog park and in that area. Um, the language change is we added in vape shop into that language. It wasn't previously in our uh, zoning code before, so we put it uh, in this change so that it's effective when we adopt this. And then uh, really three main points that I want to talk about that this document accomplishes. Uh, overall, the new zoning code is building the city from the inside out. And what do I mean by that? We're taking the core, na core neighborhoods, the historic neighborhoods where we have our parks, our historic uh, character, older homes, dense neighborhoods. It's really where the ORA, ORA activity is happening now. It's the core of our community, and we are regulating that more than the rest, which should have been done this entire time. So right now, uh, we have trouble with certain situations where somebody is doing a home occupation in the middle of a very dense residential neighborhood where it should be single family homes uh, and should have activities that are conducive to neighborhood growth. Not traffic coming and going, uh, not activities that are loud, not activities that, that disrupt uh, single family homeowners in the evening. And it, if you look at what we're proposing versus what the code is now, it's almost like in 1980 they did everything opposite. They built from the outside in. And that's why we've seen our neighborhoods, uh, the degradation in our neighborhoods. That's why we've seen this activity uh, that's happened where the planning board, the zoning board, uh, they get caught up in trying to actually interpret uh, what a use is and what an activity is. That brings me to my second point, uh, is that language. The language in our zoning code now, I think it's concise, it's clear. It's all about, as I've learned, uh, it's, uh, it's almost more about intent than what sometimes the word actually says. And we have focused uh, very much on how, if anybody reads the zoning code, if somebody comes and they're upset with a neighbor and they come to uh, the code enforcement office and they're complaining or they call their counselor and we're complaining, we can now go to the language to back us up and say, here very clearly, is what's permitted and here's what's not. There's no gray area. There's no it depends on who's sitting in the engineering office, if you know him or not, or if you know the counselor real well or not, if you know some of the planning and zoning board members really well or not, excuse me. It's really clear language, concise language that we can all uh, lean on to offer guidance and become the city that, uh, that we want to be. The third part uh, is the establishment of a table of uses. So right now, even after being a counselor for two years and a mayor for three years, I still don't know sometimes what's allowed where if somebody brings up a scenario. Uh, so I can't imagine that after five years in city government, if I still don't have everything figured out uh, when it comes to this topic, then certainly uh, our constituents, our residents don't. And what we wanted to do is create a table of uses to where anybody who's not a zoning expert, who's not a code enforcement expert, who's not a lawyer, who's not a developer, can look at this table and say, okay, I'm moving in this neighborhood, here's what's allowed, here's what I can expect to have happen around my house, and here's what uh, won't happen around my house. If you're a developer, a business owner, and you want to buy property, or you want to buy a, a building and turn it into uh, a business, uh, you know where you can do that and where you cannot do that. If you're coming to the planning board, the zoning board, or if you serve on the planning board or zoning board, uh, we now have language and we now have this table which is very clear and they can rely on that. There's no uh, ambiguity in our language. There's no, well, maybe this is okay if they do this. It's going to be very, very clear and will avoid a lot of the conflict that we've run into in, since 1980 and thus avoid a lot of the disturbances, the disruption, and the things that are holding our neighborhoods back or causing disruption in our neighborhoods. So uh, those three items, in summary, are really the biggest changes that 
this code accomplishes. I could go through and talk about what the new zone is going to be and, or, or was and what it's going to be now. I did that at the planning board meeting quite thoroughly, I think, and uh, uh, I, would, I think the media coverage has, has done a great job explaining it. So I'd encourage you, if you have questions like that, to go back through and read that and uh, go through the code. Both codes have been on the Internet now to compare and contrast uh, for a couple months. And I'll say, um, to speak to that process, I've had very few people uh, in a city of 18,000 people, uh, I've had very few people reach out with any concerns. I think the, the uh, two concerns that I heard directly was Shore Road and uh, East 2nd Street. Uh, another change on East 2nd Street that I forgot is actually uh, by Oswego County Monuments, we extended that line up too. I forgot to mention that. Um, that was one of the concerns that I heard. The other was the shore road and then the quality carpets. They were really the three legitimate concerns that I heard where somebody reached out and said, hey, we're a little unsure about this, and uh, we fixed those. Other than that, I'll say the feedback I've heard has been positive, and uh, I think people see what we're doing. I think they're excited in the direction we're taking the city, and I think they recognize that this zoning code speaks to where we are uh, taking the city and where we hope to be 20, 30, 40 years from now. So. Uh, again, happy to uh, answer questions if the councilors have any, but uh, I just appreciate your support. I appreciate everybody who has spent so much time uh, working on this document, and uh, I just can't wait to see the changes that it brings forth here in the next uh, couple of years. Councilor Tesferario. Mayor, th this has been a, a very welcome change. Um, I commend everybody on the committee it put forth the time, which was an immense amount of time, I understand. Uh, campaigning last year and actually going and getting petitions this year, I got nothing but praise for what this is, this is doing. So it, it, it's, a, it's a positive thing in the right direction. People are excited about it. They know their neighborhoods are going to be protected. They know that uh, the business districts are going to, you know, stay established, but in a way that we, we, we control them. So I, I, it's been good. It's been good for the council, and I think it's been good for the administration. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? That's it. Seeing none. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesferio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Well, clerk, please call resolution 132. Authorize Mayor to enter into a settlement agreement with National Grid Incorporated as a result of a street light audit. Councilor Hill. Councilor Gosick. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Will clerk, please call resolution 133. Authorize Mayor to sign change order number 4 with W.D. Malone Trucking and Excavating Incorporated for project modifications to the West Side Rehabilitation of Sanitary Sewer, second 25% project. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cordino, Councilor DeMassey. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Will clerk please call resolution 134? Authorize Mayor to sign amendment number one with GHD Consulting Engineers LLC for project modifications to the combined sewer separation phase three, third 25 percent project. Councilor McBrady, Councilor Hill. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 135. Authorize Mayor to execute an agreement with GHD Consulting Services for the Headworks Loading Evaluation Project at the Eastside Wastewater Treatment Plant. Councilor Cordino. Councilor Hill. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 136. Approved purchase of a new pickup truck reused by the wastewater department. Councilor Gosick. Councilor Wilmot. 
Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 137. Authorize Onondaga County purchasing to seek bids for the 2019 milling and paving project. Councilor Hill, Councilor Cordino. Uh, one comment is I'm going to instruct Onondaga County to put in the bid that the plan must be completed before Harbor Fest. Any other comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 138. Authorize Onondaga County purchasing to seek bids for the roof replacement project at the wastewater lift station located at 3 East Cayuga Street. Uh, Councilor Wilmot, Councilor McBrady. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cortino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 139. Authorize Onondaga County purchasing to seek bids for the Brittany Hill Improvement Project. Uh, Councilor Cordino, Councilor Hill. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. I have to abstain from this uh, this vote because I'm actually a resident of Brittany Hills, so I'm going to abstain. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 601. Clerk, please call resolution 140. Waive rules of the Common Council to present resolution number 141 from the floor without committee consideration. Councillor Cordino, Councillor Hill. Any comments? Will clerk, please call the roll. Councillor McBrady. Yes. Councillor DeMassey. Yes. Councillor Hill. Yes. Councillor Wilmot. Yes. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Tesserio. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Will clerk, please call resolution 141. Approve use of public space for construction areas related to downtown revitalization initiative DRI projects. Councillor Hill. Councillor Wilmot. Uh, this is an, an add-on. It's uh, an item that came out of our uh, pre-construction meeting on Thursday relating to the 104 Complete Streets project. Uh, this laydown area is proposed by W.D. Malone, who's the contractor for both Water Street, which is the pocket park um, that Larry spoke so eloquently about earlier, and the 104 Complete Streets uh, project. Uh, they're proposing this laydown area in the uh, northeast corner of the Water Street parking lot behind Canal Commons. Uh, also at the same time, or in, or in the near future anyway, uh, the contractor for Global Buffet we expect is going to want this area and even a little more than this area for their laydown area as well. Uh, and <coughs> rather than having to come back to the council for public space, also these these laydown areas may change as well if they're down on the other end of Water Street uh, by Harbor Optical. They may want to lay down there for some time if they're working there. My point is they're going to be downtown, make no mistake about it, and I've said this so many times, is going to be uh, messy, congested, busy uh, the next couple of months. But it's really, uh, in my view, it's the price we're paying for significant amount of progress and I think for the most part our constituents, the motorists, the business owners down there, not all but most, uh, acknowledge that and respect that and looking forward to it. Um, so what this resolution does is authorizes this lay down area but also uh, gives me the ability as these construction projects move on to be able to designate a lay down area as they need it. So in some cases they may not have two weeks to go through the process and, and come back. So it gives me the authority to say yeah you can lay down in this area for the next week, the next few days just to keep the construction going. And both of these bids both projects have to be done by Harbor Fest, so timing is everything. We're praying for good weather, and uh, we just want to be as accommodating to the contractor uh, and try to keep things moving as quickly as possible without getting bogged down. After the construction meeting on Thursday, I sent out a letter to uh, the residents in Canal and above Canal Commons and also all the business owners along the, that block of West First Street and the Pontiac. Uh, telling them about this lay down area, why it's happening, when it's happening, um, and also telling them about the 
Global Buffet project that's happening soon and explaining the change in traffic pattern. Essentially what we're doing is, is shutting down this area of Water Street and shutting off about half of that parking lot so that'll push the parking down to behind the Pontiac where really the business owner should be parking anyway. And uh, uh, it'll, it's certainly going to uh, cost about half of that uh, parking lot. And um, the gentleman that I sent around to hand out, hand deliver the letters said uh, that really most people were understanding one store owner uh, to be expected was a little concerned about the Global Buffet project, not about ours, but I don't think that was related to anything relevant. Um, so I think for the most part the folks down there realize what's coming and they support what's coming and uh, it's going to be a rough couple of weeks, couple of months, but I think the end product for both projects will be worth it. Um, I won't say anything about the speaker earlier because he left other than uh, uh, most of what he said as expected isn't accurate. Um, that's nothing new. Uh, we actually changed the plan a little bit because he dollies in his kegs into the basement of the building when we originally designed the plan. Uh, we had a curb there which would have made he could have had a ramp but instead of listening to it I just said let's change the design and be done with it. Uh, the city engineer is actually the trustee to that building so some of what he has said is verbatim of what I've already heard anyway which is odd. And uh, so we changed that design so he can still um, do that. Other than that, that one legitimate, half legitimate concern that we addressed, he should be thanking us for the level of investment that's, that we're putting down there. I think the pocket park and the improvements to Water Street and the parking lot will draw more people there. That's the point. Um, I think you have uh, support from most of the business owners down there. You're always going to have one. What's odd is we actually tried to get him to participate in the DRI, get him some money for his historic building that's neglected clearly. Uh, he didn't want anything to do with it. We tried to get him a $1 million grant for the Restore New York grant, which I knew we were going to win. He's in the DRI zone. It's a historic building. It's falling down. We just about guaranteed that he would win a $1 million grant. He didn't want anything to do with that. So my sympathy level for him is about minimal. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, sometimes you're your own worst enemy. So uh, we'll hear the conspiracy theories and everything else later, I'm sure. So other than that, though, the projects are uh, moving forward. And uh, I would just ask people to uh, hang in there, residents to hang in there, motorists, pedestrians, business owners to hang in there and uh, the end product will be worth it. Any other comments? And I appreciate the council support giving me this authority to be able to keep these projects going. Seeing none, clerk please call the roll. Councilor McBrady. Yes. Councilor DeMassey. Yes. Councilor Hill. Yes. Councilor Wilmot. Yes. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Tesserio. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Any other business to come before the council? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Tesserario, Councillor Corradino. Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor McBrady. Yes. Councillor DeMassey. Yes. Councillor Hill. Yes. Councillor Wilmot. Yes. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Tesserario. Yes. Councillor Corradino. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Meeting is adjourned.